Hello, it's me again. You know, I think I do these videos mostly either because I like talking to myself or because I like talking about anatomy or because I like to talk to myself about anatomy. I don't know. Anyway, um, last week we looked at the small intestine, so our natural progression this week is to move on to the large intestine, right? This guy looping around here. Small intestine, there's quite a lot going on in there. That video took a lot more effort than I expected. You think the small intestine is a simple thing, but it's not. The large intestine, I'm sure it's a simple thing. I'm sure there's not that much we can talk about. So this week, let's look at the large intestine in the human abdomen, and it's gonna be anatomy, mostly. So we're going to talk about the general layout of the large intestine, the parts of the large intestine, the blood supply of the large intestine, there's a couple of interesting things going on in there, uh, the venous drainage, which kind of matches it. Uh, oh, mesenteries. You get in the hang of mesentery, retroperitoneal, peritoneum, that sort of thing. We'll talk about how that relates to the large bowel. And then we'll um, stop when we get to the end, when we get to the anal canal. The anal canal is a whole talk on its own. There's loads of great anatomy in the anal canal. Um, if you, you know, if fecal continence is important to you, the anal canal's anatomy is important to you too. So what about the functions of the large bowel? When we looked at the small intestine, the small intestine was very busy in um, digesting the food that we put into it. There's loads of enzymes and all sorts of cool things going on. And there were a lot of uh, surface adaptations to give a massive amount of surface area for absorption across the cells into the blood supply, right? So the large intestine, it has a different job. The large intestine is absorbing anything that's still useful to us that hasn't been absorbed. So from the small intestine, um, it squeezes in kind of what's well, gonna become feces and it's still holding a lot of water at that point. So the small intestine, sorry, the, so the large intestine is gonna absorb water from its contents, because the water's useful to us, right? It's gonna absorb, you know, calcium, magnesium, uh, chloride, iron, all that sort of stuff that gets into the large bowel. It's gonna absorb anything that is still useful to us and the rest of it will get passed through and, and chucked out the other end. The large bowel is a real home to bacteria and other uh, microscopic life forms as well. And we make use of those helpful bacteria because they digest things that are still in there that we can't digest and they produce things that we need like vitamin K and biotin and other vitamins and, and all sorts of things. So the, uh, the, when we talk about gut flora, when we talk about the bacteria in the gut, a lot of them are in the large intestine and they're doing lots of useful things. They're also doing kind of uh, interesting side effect type things like producing gas. Going back to the faecal continence idea there, you need a tight seal to keep that gas in. Anyway, we'll get to the anal canal another day. So that's the job of the, of the large intestine, is absorb the rest of the stuff that's useful to us, house a bunch of bacteria which can help make a whole bunch of other things useful to us, and compact the contents to faeces, then store those faeces so we can evacuate them at a time that is convenient to us. In the small intestine, we uh, we see histologically there's an outer layer of smooth muscle which is in fact two layers of smooth muscle and uh, there's a circular layer and a longitudinal layer that layout continues into the large intestine so in the outer part of the large intestine forming the wall so we've got that inner mucosa um, but we've also got um, a layer of circular muscle, which does the same thing, peristalsis, squeezes things along it. But we also have that longitudinal muscle. But in the large intestine, we can see that uh, layer of longitudinal muscle quite easily. And we see it on this model here. See this stripe? And there will be three stripes. So if you, if you look inside a cadaver, or you look inside um, someone's abdomen during surgery and you find the large bowel, you'll find three stripes running the length of the large intestine. Those get called the tinei coli, or coli, tinei coli. Difficult to spell, difficult to say. Um, and if that longitudinal muscle's job is to shorten the length of the tube, it has pre-shortened 
the large intestine, right? So if you, you think about your nice long stretched out tube, this longitudinal muscle has already shortened it. And by shortening it, it has caused it to wrinkle up a little bit. And that's what these wrinkles are. And what's formed are these little kind of pouches, right? And these are the haustra. So these saculations that we see, these are the haustra. So the tinei coli and the haustra are very distinctive of the large bowel. You pull a loop of bowel, uh, you, if, you, if you look at a piece of bowel in the large intestine, you can tell it's large intestine, not just by its size, but by these pieces as well. Um, something else you might see in cadavers or uh, in, in, in real people during surgery, you might see blebs of fat hanging off the large bowel. Uh, and this is one of those words that stuck with me ever since I first studied anatomy donkeys years ago. Don't know why. But these are the epiploic appendices. Brilliant term. Um, and the epiploic appendices also get called the omental appendages or omental appendices. Right? These, these terms are kind of interchangeable. Epiploic and a mental mean the same thing. One's Latin, one's Greek. And you know the greater omentum uh, floats over here. So omentum means apron. Um, epiploic is something to do with like sailing, floating on the sea or something. So omental and epiploic refer to that greater omentum hanging over here, right? So then we get stuff associated with it getting called epiploic or omental. So the little blebs of fat are actually saculations of peritoneum with fat inside them and they're called the epiploic appendices or omental appendices or epiploic appendages, you know, some sort of combination of those words. So that's a, a standout uh, indicator of large bowel as well. What do they do? Nobody knows. They're just there. Um, and while we're talking about the greater omentum, so you know, here's the stomach, all right? And you remember that this is the greater curvature of the stomach. From the greater curvature of the stomach, we find the greater omentum. You can see half of it here. So the greater omentum is that double fold of peritoneum that forms this apron covering um, the small intestine. It's the policeman of the abdomen, right? You know, if you get inflammation of the small bowel, it kind of sticks to it and stops that inflammation from spreading. That's the idea. Now, this is embryologically, it's just um, an extension of the mesentery that's there in the embryo. This is the posterior part of the stomach in the embryo and the stomach rotates around and pulls it around and this grows and so on. But you see the large intestine is here. Um, in the adult, this double fold of greater omentum folds back and attaches to the anterior surface of the, the transverse mesocolon. But we'll come back to the transverse mesocolon in a bit. But that's, that's where the term omental or epiploic comes into play. So if those are the external features of the large bowel, the internal features um, are similar to the small intestine. You know, there's a mucosa there, but there are no villi. There's no, there's no villi within the large intestine. Um, but there are crypts still. There are still um, crypts into the, into the mucosal epithelial lining of the large intestine, which produce mucus and that sort of thing. Many of the cells inside the large intestine are similar to those in the small intestine. You've still got, um, you know, you've still got uh, cells making mucus and cells making hormones. You've got the enteric nervous system and that sort of thing. But none of those cells are making any digestive enzymes at this point. That's all done in the small intestine. So let's consider the parts of the large intestine then. Don't take the heart out. Pop the stomach out. Let's pop the... The small intestine ends and the ileum passes its contents into the, oh look, that's pretty, into the cecum. All right, so that's the last part of the ileum here. There's the ileocecal valve, and this is the blind ending pouch of the cecum. So the cecum is the first part of the, of the large intestine. The large intestine is typically described as framing the small bowel. Um, there's a very famous structure that hangs off the cecum. It's the appendix. And it can kind of appear in different places. Let's see if we can find the appendix on this one. Oh, that's easy. There it is there. All right, so there's the cecum. There's the opening into the appendix. And here's the appendix here. So the appendix has often been described as a vestigial organ, a structure of no use to us. Um, it's famous because it often gets inflamed because it's a blind ending pouch. It's, um, it's a lymphoid. Uh, tissue 
and that blind ending pouch sometimes gets infected, gets inflamed, causes pain, and of course there's a risk of it bursting, causing death, and that sort of thing. So um, inflammation and pain, um, the characteristic signs are you get you know, uh, lateral pain that moves towards the umbilicus, maybe moves back again, something like that, and guarding and the usual stuff. Um, requires surgery to remove the appendix and get rid of um, the inflammation and those problems. And it is, it is a dangerous thing, it's a risky thing. So treat um, pain in the lower right quadrant is a, you know, is a serious thing. It's usually the first thing we think of, isn't it, is, a, is inflamed appendix. But modern science um, suggests that the appendix is, um, is a repository for good bacteria for the gut. And after a bout of illness, maybe of diarrhea or a loss of the good bacteria in your gut, if you have an appendix, you can quickly repopulate your gut with good bacteria from the store that's saved in the appendix. That's the current thinking. Seems like a good idea. So the appendix is useful. So um, here's the cecum, and the cecum is the first part of the ascending colon. This is the last part of the small intestine, the ileum, and the ileum is passing its contents into the cecum here. So the ileum's done the last job of absorption of the small bowel, it's passing its contents through this ileocecal valve into the cecum, and then the cecum collects all that stuff and passes it into the large intestine. The large intestine changes direction, changes direction by 90 degrees, and then it runs across the abdomen as the, as the transverse colon here. This change in direction here gets called uh, a flexure because it's by the liver it gets called the hepatic flexure or the right colic flexure either is appropriate and then the transverse colon passes across the abdomen changes direction again here and again it's a 90 degree change and it descends as the descending colon and this change in direction of the large intestine gets called the left colic flexure or the splenic flexure because of the spleen here you can just about see the spleen there so this is the splenic flexure or the left colic flexure and then the large intestine descends as the descending colon and you see how it wiggles here so we're forming this kind of s shape so that s shape means that this is the sigmoid colon and the job of the sigmoid colon is to pass the large bowel posteriorly and down into the pelvis uh, and where it straightens out it becomes the rectum, rectum meaning straight. So the last part of the large intestine is the rectum, and the rectum descends into the pelvis, and it ends at the pelvic floor muscles, right? So the rectum is the last part of the large intestine. His job then is to store the feces until an appropriate time for evacuation. The rectum ends at the pelvic floor, and within the pelvic floor we find the structures of the anal canal, which controls then, you know, closing off the rectum so nothing can escape from it, or opening it to allow for evacuation. So as we were going around the large intestine, did you notice the mesentery? In the embryo, all of this starts as a simple tube attached to the posterior abdominal wall by, you know, double sheet of of peritoneum forming a mesentery and holding it all in place and as it lengthens and convolutes and gets more complicated so does the mesentery. The large bowel is a little bit special. The ascending colon and the descending colon have lost their mesentery. So they used to have a mesentery and they've been pulled back against the posterior abdominal wall and they're now fixed in place. The peritoneum overlies the ascending colon and then goes back and so these get called secondarily retroperitoneal because they did have a mesentery and then they've pulled, been, been pulled back into place so now they're retroperitoneal to all intents and purposes but they're secondarily retroperitoneal because they didn't used to be. Um, that means that the ascending colon and the descending colon are generally held in place so you're going to find them where you expect to find them whereas a small bowel can move around. The transverse colon does have a mesentery. It has this mesocolon. So the transverse, meso, uh, the transverse colon is more likely to move around. And in fact, you may see it hanging down like this in patients, rather than being up here as part of this classical picture frame that's described in textbooks and on models. It often loops around because of this, this mesocolon. So the mesocolon, the transverse mesocolon, holds the transverse colon to the posterior abdominal wall. You see the pancreas there, which is retroperitoneal. Um, now the descending colon, in about a third of people, I think, has a short mesentery, so it may move around a little bit, but not a great deal. But otherwise, because 
these are held in place. And imagine this being covered in a sheet of mesentery. We get these gutters, right? These, uh, these curved shapes, these gutters running on either side of the ascending and descending colon. Um, these get called um, paracolic gutters. They're interesting clinically because um, if you have an infection, if you have pus, if you have bacteria, if you have blood, if you have some other fluid, within the, the, the abdomen, it can track up and down these paracolic gutters. So if somebody's led down, then it might track posteriorly and end up in the, um, in the lesser sac. If they're sat up, then it, then it might track down this away, right? So if you're hunting around for stuff in the abdomen, <laughs> fluid floating around, then the paracolic gutters might be useful. Because don't forget, right? Normally you've got a small, small bowel covering all that mesentery in the way there. The sigmoid colon has a pretty lengthy uh, mesentery. So the sigmoid colon is quite mobile, but then the rectum is held in place posteriorly, so that doesn't move around. But um, so okay, the, so the mesentery and the peritoneum of the large intestine is variable. So embryologically, we often talk about uh, foregut, midgut, and hindgut, right? Um, and we say. That, um, so you start off in the embryo and there's a simple tube running the length of the embryo which forms the GI tract and it's held in place by that dorsal mesentery. Now the, the GI, the, the gut tube, it runs down and then it loops out anteriorly where it connects to the yolk stalk still. So it loops out like this and then descends. So that looping bit is the midgut, the tube above it is the foregut and the tube um, inferior to it is the hindgut. Um, this is very handy because the, each part has an artery associated with it. So the artery of the foregut is the celiac trunk, the artery of the midgut is the superior mesenteric artery, and the artery of the hindgut is the inferior mesenteric artery. Um, and that simple tube, as it elongates and folds and moves around, it carries branches of those arteries with them. So from the foregut, anything that forms from the foregut is going to be supplied with branches of the celiac trunk, you see. Now, the large bowel, so if the, the esophagus and stomach and the first part of the duodenum are foregut, the midgut then is the rest of the duodenum, the small bowel, and uh, this, the first part of the, um, the large intestine is also midgut. So the cecum, the ascending colon, and the transverse colon to about here is, is formed from midgut. So it's all supplied with blood vessels from the superior mesenteric artery. And then about two thirds of the way along the transverse colon, um, it becomes hindgut. So the remainder of the transverse colon, the descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and the upper part of the anal canal are all formed from hindgut. So they're all supplied with blood from branches of the inferior mesenteric artery. Now I would think that that's a good thing because it would mean that um, over here, um, you'd have a crossing over of the blood supply from the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. So there'd be a lot of backup, lots of anastomoses, and it would be great. But in fact, the opposite is true. This is called a watershed area here, and it's an area at risk of ischemia. The reason why is because, because this is the last part of the kind of the last part of the midgut over here, and this is the first part of the hindgut. They, they're kind of um, supplied with blood by the, you know, the, like the end branches of the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, which means if you have like a systemic hypotension, you have a systemic um, reduced um, blood flow um, through, you know, um, heart disease, or um, does diabetes affect this? I don't know, it's more peripheral, isn't it? But maybe, or through disseminated intra-arterial coagulation, DIC, right? So if you have like reduced perfusion of small blood vessels, then this area actually becomes at risk of ischemia. So watch out for that. Um, so this is the watershed area here, this around the splenic flexure. Other than that, uh, there's a marginal artery, which you can kind of see around here. See this artery around here? There's a marginal artery following the, uh, the large bowel that's um, supplied with blood from the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. Um, and the venous drainage is similar, so just like the small intestine, 
all of the blood from the large intestine is going to go to the liver. So in this case we have the inferior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric vein. They're going to meet with the splenic vein uh, and then uh, the portal vein. They'll dra all drain into the portal vein, the portal vein will run to the liver and the liver will receive all the blood from the large intestine. And one day we'll talk about portosystemic anastomoses, right? You know about portosystemic anastomoses? They're quite cool. There you go then, that's your lot. That's the anatomy of the large intestine. Um, so the parts of the large intestine, which bits are retroperitoneal and which bits have a mesentery, the blood supply and venous drainage of the large intestine, um, some brief notes on the smooth muscle and how the large intestine looks externally, uh, and uh, stuff like that. Um, Alright then, done. See you next week.